Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome to the Red Bull Ring, and welcome to the Ferrari SF15T. Yes, this is the centerpiece, in my opinion, of the brand new Assetto Corsa Red Pack released yesterday on PC, Steam, and I'm not sure if they're on any other platforms, but in any case, Red Pack was released yesterday to much fanfare. Over the last week or so, there's been a lot of excitement on uh, many of the sim racing message boards anticipating this release. And I have to say, it's been well warranted as of now. The SF15T, driven by Sebastian Vettel and Kimi Raikkonen in the 2015 Formula One season. Not the most competitive car on the grid, but I guess you could call it a reasonable second behind Mercedes, although a very distant second. In the hands of Sebastian Vettel, the 15T won in Malaysia, Hungary, and Singapore, and scored a further 19 podium finishes that year. So, a uh, reasonable effort from Ferrari, which uh, has been a team very much in the midst of reconstruction in recent years, following their dominance in the early 2000s, but still not a bad effort, I would guess. Kunos, however, far from a bad effort in reproducing this car. This is a 2015 Formula One car. And it's somewhat of a rarity in sim racing for us to get official releases of such late model Formula One cars. And the red pack, of course, this car is accompanied by the F138, the 2013 Ferrari F1 car, the last of the modern V8 era. So two late model Formula One cars in official releases. Like I said, it's a rarity. Only because the way Formula One works with development, it's, yes, development is very, very fast. However, it's still very, very secretive because teams often use previous cars as test beds when they do tire tests with Pirelli or when their young drivers wanted to give it a go. They use their older cars kind of to try new things to apply for the current championship. So for Ferrari to grant Kunos the kind of access that they needed, not only to reproduce this car with such stunning detail visually, but dynamically, especially when it comes to running the uh, MGUH and MGUK, those are the energy harvesting systems, that help uh, give the car an extra power boost to the to the tune of 160 horsepower while you're on track. For Kunos to be able to replicate that, they needed some really, really sensitive data from Ferrari to make that happen accurately in this sim. So for Ferrari to grant them that kind of access is pretty extraordinary. Just giving you a look. Have a look at that front wing. That is detail if I ever saw it. Some modelers just didn't sleep for a couple of days while they were trying to hone that, but as we've now come to expect from Kudos, very, very nicely done, inside and out. We're going to go inside in just a few seconds, but see the cockpit and driver detail in there? Beautiful. So, the cockpit. I mentioned the energy recovery systems. Those components make this car one of the most complicated ones to drive that I have ever encountered in sim racing. Those of you who have an iRacing subscription, you've probably driven the McLaren MP430 over there. If you've got experience in that car, it will help you trying to adjust to this one. You're running the MGUH, you're running the MGUK, you have DRS, and you have uh, a manual override for the Kerr system as well. So, going back to the outside for a moment, I just want to show you the DRS. There it is. And now to talk about the steering wheel and all that stuff. Have a look at the upper left of the steering wheel, uh, leftmost on the shift lights. You see the green light just to the left and below of the DRS lettering there. And now you see two of them. That's your status light for DRS open. And now DRS closed. Just as in reality, the DRS is only activated, at least on this track, in the designated DRS zones. And when you press the button, the flap opens. When you get on the brake, flap closes. It also closes if you happen to hit that button again before you brake. So that's fine. Now for the energy recovery. You see on the bottom of the steering wheel display, you see that green bar? in between a yellow bar on the left and a red bar on the right, that's your state of charge for your MGUK batteries. 
Obviously, it's going to give you power as you're under acceleration, and it's going to be harvesting energy from the rear axle under braking. You have to manage that as you're driving the car. So you've got a lot of controls that you've got to, first of all, map out on your setup, be it on your wheel or in a button box that you've got. So it takes some time to figure out the best ways to do that. And then you've got to learn about what all of these different modes do. So we're going to cycle through the uh, MGUK modes right now. So we have balanced high. So that's a, it tries to balance energy harvesting and energy deployment. You get a lot of power, but it also try to harvest as much as it can in the braking zones or when you're not quite at full throttle going down a straight. Overtake, so that's a that's basically maximum power for a short time as you're trying to gain position. Top speed gives you all the power at the top end, so you're trying to you know maximize your potential down a straight. Hot lap, this is just full beans all the time. Charging, no power delivery, but plenty of harvesting and then balance low, basically the same as balanced high, except you don't get quite as much power down the straights. In addition to that, you've got recovery modes to deal with. So this is dictating how much energy you're harvesting off of the rear axle under braking. This setting is very important to get acquainted with because this is affecting the balance of the car under braking. Harvest off of the rear axle and you know that if your brake balance is wrong, particularly a little bit too biased um, toward the rear, you can get rear locking into corners and that will make you spin pretty damn fast. So 100% it's basically like having another set of rear brakes. And then you cycle down progressively in steps of 10 until you get to zero, which then leaves all of the braking back to the mechanical brakes on the car. Additionally, you have a manual override just to dump all of your curves energy whenever you want. So upper right of the steering wheel, you see the K1 button there. And right next to it you have a light. So it's off right now. On. This is the manual curves override. It's a press and hold function. So as long as you've got the button down and that purple light is on, you have your manual curves. So it's just going to dump all of your energy into the rear axle under acceleration. Off. Light goes out and you're back into whatever mode that you had previously selected. brake bias and all of that stuff as you would expect and the interplay between all of these settings becomes much more apparent when you're on track when you're in charging mode you basically have no power coming through into the rear axle until you're basically at full throttle because the thing is just trying to harvest energy all the time and then when you are down to zero percent energy recovery it is just full power all the time and then depending on your delivery mode you either have no delivery if you set it into charging, or if you're on hot lap or overtake, for example, it is just bang. It's like flipping a switch. There's no progression at all in the power delivery. So things to get used to. And in terms of balancing all of these things over whether you're in a qualifying situation or you're in a race situation, very important to make sure that you don't run out of ERS power you know, before a critical moment when you really might need it. So. Enough blabber, let's get the thing out on track and try to explain to you the dynamics that are going on. So we've got the engine start. I am in MGUK charge mode right now with 100% recovery. So you're going to notice the car's going to want to bog down as I try to pull away. So I actually got to give it quite a lot of throttle to keep that happening. Hit exit here at the Red Bull Ring. It's very, very tight. You don't want to overdo it. And now we're on the racetrack. Up into turn two. You turn in here, and the apex is here, Nico Rosberg. Here's the second DRS zone in the course of the lap, down the back straight. First one is down the start finish straight. We'll get there in a little bit. Obviously, as you can hear, 
Kunos has done a very nice job with the sounds as well. You get the engine sounds, turbo, MGUK harvest, and all that good stuff. On to the start finish straight, short lap here at the Red Bull Ring. This is the first DRS zone. Up into turn one. This is very, very steep. Those of you who know what you're looking at, you'll know that this is an eight-speed gearbox. However, the ratios are fixed, so you cannot adjust them. And they're set for maximum theoretical top speed. Kunos went for this because they have such a variety of tracks in Seto Corsa. So at the uh, Red Bull ring, don't call it the A1 ring, um, you're never going to get eighth gear for the most part. So, we're going to switch our MGUK mode now to hot lap, and we're going to turn off energy recovery. So now this is full power, and you can see that green bar on the bottom of the steering wheel ticking down, because we are using energy. definitely see the difference in acceleration now. that half a lap and we've used over half of our electricity. So keeping it in hot lap mode is not going to be good for most situations unless you're doing a hot lap. One hot lap. As you can see we are nearly out of power. We haven't even completed a lap yet. And that's it, we're out of electricity. So now back into charging mode. Yeah, difference in top speed, we were hitting 300 before, now 284. of what the car is like to drive. I'm hesitant to describe it as well balanced only because the balance of the car is largely dictated by what mode you have your MGUK set to. If you're running 100% charging like I am right now, it feels like that there's far too much braking force in the rear because there is. If you've got it set up for uh, a hot lap as we did previously, then a car feels very, very stable and very, very poised. So therefore it leaves me in the situation of trying to look for constants, things that don't really change regardless of what you do with your energy harvest. I'll say the car is a very, very sharp and responsive turn in. Only got to turn the wheel once to make it do what you want. Power delivery in any mode is convincing enough, I would say. 
When you're in charge mode, however, like I am now with 100% harvest, it's surprising the amount of throttle you've got to give it before the car really starts to take off. Really noticeable out of the uh, first two turns because you're doing such low speed to begin with, but you've got to be basically on full throttle before the car really starts to accelerate. Again, because that rear axle is just trying to charge the batteries. So let's see, coming through turn one right now. No XL, no XL, full throttle, there's the XL. Throttle, a yep, little wide, half throttle, not much, not much, full throttle, there it is. Let's go for a mode change for balanced high. See, we are deploying. Yep. <laughs> and a ballast change, of course. Got now more power as I'm coming on the throttle. Caught me out a little bit with some oversteer. coming down on the Delta because we've got horsepower coming down the straight again. And you see our top speed has changed in accordance. Oops. Full throttle. See how long it took that thing to really start to catch again. I'm still in 100% energy recovery. Yep, I was not on the brakes at all there. Into the corner I was, but by the time I turned in, I was off the brakes, and the thing kept decelerating. I was already uh, coming back onto the throttle. Braking continued. That's all from the rear axle, and it caught me out. So you have to be very, very cognizant of where your settings are at. Let's go down to 50% recovery. back in our 100% charging mode. Again, I don't have too many laps in this car at the moment. So I'm still trying to figure out the best way to manage all of these systems, as I'm sure most of you are as well. do 
have a very dramatic influence from the MG UK over the overall balance of the car. Here's our pit entrance. pit lane. Not on the brakes. See it slowed down all by itself through there from the energy harvest on the rear. So it's it's pretty dramatic once again. But that, my beloved audience, is the SF-15T. Hopefully you get some idea of what it's like to drive. And uh, hopefully you try to drive it yourself, because it's now available on Steam at least for $10 US. So do the appropriate conversion, but again, it's not going to break your bank, and it's well worth it as far as I can tell.